everyone, and a very, very warm welcome to World of Fashion, hosted by Harper's Bazaar Arabia at Mall of the Emirates. <laughs> I'm Olivia Phillips. I'm the editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar Arabia. And I am thrilled to be joined on stage tonight by Andrea Brocker, one of the most exceptional talents working out of Dubai right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at just 16 years old, Andrea was awarded the incredible accolade of the world's youngest couturier by the Guinness Book of Records. Yes. Um, he has studied at not just one, but two of the most prestigious fashion schools in the entire world. He's dressed Lady Gaga, no big deal. <laughs> um, and our prediction is that he is set for truly dizzying heights. Uh, we are very proud to have him in Dubai, and we're very proud to have him on stage tonight. So please give a very, very warm welcome to Andrea Brocker. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Look at that. All, all the love in the room for you. <laughs> very happy. Very grateful. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us. I really Thank am you grateful. Thank for having me. Um, and that wasn't just lip service either. I, um, I, I really believe that your pieces inspire real jaw-dropping kind of reactions. Um, and I've heard you refer to them as ominous as well. Yes. Which I think is a really interesting um, adjective to use for clothing. And it's perfect for Gaga, actually. In, yeah, in many ways it is. So and I kind of wanted you to talk us through um, how, how that happened first. How did you end up dressing her? So I graduated under the pandemic from Central St. Martins, and we had to all, we didn't have the graduation show, so that was the biggest way to get seen. So we took it in charge, I took it in charge to uh, launch my collection online through Instagram, and I really worked hard on trying to get the most visibility possible by sharing it around, showing it to people, sharing with editors, with celebrity stylists, and, and things like this. And um, I launched it into, into, the, into the web, and then one day I get an email from Gaga's team and they want the, the monster gown Perfect. for her. And then it ended up going through and it got the cover of Billboard. Um, so it was actually pretty organic. I think that when, when uh, your intention is honest towards one uh, specific practice or product, even to many, if the intention is honest and the identity is coherent with another creative, then that entity will end up coming to you naturally. It's like, you know, the attraction force. That's, in my opinion, the only way that you can find specific um, successes is that it has to be genuine and natural. You know, if I have a, a world and the world of someone else is similar and I'm honest about mine, they're going to end up meeting. Always. It's quite a spiritual way of looking at, at things, I think. In many ways. And you can even like, uh, bring this in the concept of, of love, for example and you know, falling in love with someone else and who is your soulmate, who is not. You I know? love that. Do you <laughs> feel like there's an affinity between that kind of theory and how you feel when you create your pieces? Do you feel like you fall in love with the piece as you make it? I think that, is it too loud? Yeah, no. Good, okay, great. Yeah, um, I think that every single practice that's creative comes from a form of love you have for it. So I'm very obsessive and passionate and the two of them are born from a sense of love. So we have love and we have hate two opposing forces, which are in many ways equal, in my opinion. And so I have a love and a hate relationship with fashion because it's so much part of me and my art. And so um, I think that that's why I'm able to create uh, passionately and intensely, because I love it, and also I hate that I love it. <laughs> um, I, I, I feel you, actually. Um, I think it comes across, because I think you can't create pieces like the ones that we're seeing behind us without having that kind of passion. I mean, it, they literally, it, it just, it, 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 it shouts it, you know. Your pieces are, um, yes. you know, they have a very strong message. Um, you know, I will, I will, I'll say one thing, that every single piece there is very laborious, as you know, and, and, and labor-intensive, and every single one of them in the process of making them have actually damaged my health, which is an issue, but also it's something which I find really interesting. Every single dress on there, and um, maybe this is intense to say, but I am who I am, is that each one has a bit of my blood on it. And so whenever I have a piece of blood on my dress, okay? Beauty is pain. Beauty is pain. <laughs> <As they say. laughs> so actually, it's, it's true. When I get that, I'm like, oh, wow, I really went the other level for it. And, and, um, and I'm not, I don't condone this in any way, shape, or form, but it's interesting how I always labor my work to such an intense degree that it physically impacts me. 
I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on this. I mean, specifically, do you feel like in order to be an artist, you need to be slightly tortured? Well, I think that there is, uh, like, art can come through many different ways. It can come through um, how you feel inside from specific turbulence you might have, tumultuous life and these kind of things, which gives you a, f a, for a form of fire to want to express what you need to or express. Or hunger. Or hunger, a lot. I know that me and my family felt a lot of hunger for specific things after we went through tumultuous times. Um, and then there's also, you know, creatives that are informed by aesthetic. So they grow up in a very tasteful family. And so their visuals are very beautiful or they're very, you know, informed. So the aesthetic is what makes them artists. And so there's two different ways, in my opinion. There's one that's born from drive and hunger. And there's one that's born from being exposed to such beautiful things your whole life, which I think I have a middle between the two, by the way, and exposed to such beauty. And so you can recreate the beauty. You sound like you've thought about it a lot. Um, I want to ask you about your family, because when we spoke the other day, mm -hmm. Um, you said that your mother was a big influence in yes. her early fashion collections. So yes. can you tell us a little bit about your formative experiences and how you got into fashion in the first place? Yeah, so um, I've been uh, exposed to fashion from a very young age because my mother is a very glamorous woman who would invest in very special pieces uh, in her wardrobe from like the late 80s, 90s and early 2000s and things like that. So there was a lot of uh, archive pieces from you know Chanel, Versace, Mugler, um, Gianfranco Fede. So I grew up looking at these clothes and looking at the shoes and bags and being really obsessed with my sisters who are here. Um, and it was, it, was, uh, <laughs> it was always a very inspiring process because when you're learning, you know, when you're being nurtured and you're from your surrounding, you get influenced by things. And uh, she had all this beautiful, incredible archive of things and that really inspired me. And so that's when I first started, I think, identifying to the idea of having my art linked to fashion. And tell us a little bit more about your art as well, because I know that obviously you draw, you're a, a phenomenal artist. Thank you. Um, and I know that you draw a lot, and you said that when you were growing up, you used to draw comic books and anime. Anime, yes, anime. Um, so another family influence was that we grew up watching lots of anime, because in Italian culture, anime was huge. You know, there was a, there was a program called Bim Boom Bam, and uh, there was a lot of Sailor Moon. Again. Beam Boom Bam. <laughs> and basically, we'd watch Beam Boom Bam a lot. And I remember all of the songs. We were obsessed. They were both laughing. Um, and there was Sailor Moon on Beam Boom Bam. And I found a love for Sailor Moon, a an obsession, actually. Uh, I loved the fantasy and, and all of that. And so I would draw my own comics inspired by these like heroine features. So all of my work are actually little heroines. Each dress I have is a heroine in itself. And that links back to the idea of womanhood that I have had influence through from my mother, my sisters, my aunt, back to the topic of the, of the media I digested, such as these cartoons where there are fe heroine female figures who are fighting, so to speak. So this idea of heroine has actually been translated directly into my work. So every work you find is like a female superhero. Who's your heroine? Who's my heroine? Hmm. No pressure. I know you've got two sisters here, so. Yeah. <laughs> My heroine, I actually think every single, when we're talking about female heroines, I think every single woman in, in, in my life, in my family, is my heroine. I think so. It's a yeah? very diplomatic yeah. answer, isn't it, girls? Yeah, yeah super diplomatic, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, oh, it's lovely. If it, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, you can never uh, put it to one, because there's like a cultural heroine, and then there is, you know, a personal one. The personal one is more impactful. The cultural one can inspire you to do more research and be better. But the personal heroine is the one that actually gets you to grow uh, as a person, in my opinion. Um, I want to come back to your heroine dresses and the individual dresses and um, the aesthetic a little bit more shortly. Um, but I wanted to discuss something that you said to me the other day when you were describing your parents as real nonconformists, yeah. risk takers. Um, and you said, we weren't given a box to think in, we were given infinity. Yeah. Uh, which is beautiful, actually. Um, I want to I wanna hear from you how you feel that approach to life has informed what we've seen behind us, um, like, you know, in terms of the actual pieces themselves. So there's really interesting things um, when, when discussing the idea of infinity. Um, <laughs> I'm going in a spiral. So... First of all, Rei Kawakubo, a great artist and designer in fashion, um, always uh, spoke around the theme that limitation is freedom. So 
ta ta yeah. So yes. ta to tackling a rat, which is why you know um, Japanese fashion can be so singularly black. Uh, because and white, because the limitation within these forms gives a freedom to express certain different manners, which is why also I draw and do my art in black and white. Um, but in the concept of limitation is freedom, actually, and going as a, from a different perspective of what we discussed, um, when you are given the infinite choice to do whatever you want, you can actually get very lost and you can get undecided and you don't know what to do and where to find a reference point. Um, so not being boxed up actually makes you reach your objectives a bit later than they should. But in the process, you discover more because you become wiser because you're more lost. And so you have to figure things out for yourself, which is why I said we had to in some way parent ourselves growing up because of the freedom of things. So you become self-aware eventually, I presume, but a bit later. Yeah. It's such a fascinating philosophy and an outlook, actually. Yeah. I think it's, a, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of my favorite parts of Andrea's story is that he actually got his first big break at the very first world of fashion <laughs> in 2009. 2009, yeah. 2009. Mm -hmm. um, so this feels very, uh, it feels a bit like kismet. It feels a little bit like full circle. It is made me very happy, but I would like you to tell everybody that story. Okay, so I'll yeah. In 2009, I was 13, and I was really thirsty to get into the industry because I felt that there was uh, nothing else that I could do which would make me happy. So um, I, did, I took every single opportunity that I could to break into the industry, and the first one was that there was a first Harper's Bazaar World of Fashion event, so I'd basically break in and everything. Um, <laughs> break in the event, slip from the back. Like No one break in. No, no one break <laughs> in. <laughs> And so um, I ended up uh, speaking to the designers. There was a lot of creative directors that came to these events, which was amazing, actually. Um, and Alice Temperley was, was one of the people launching their boutique in an event. And then I was 13. I brought my sketchbook with me. And I went up to her. And, and like, I tapped her. And I was like, please look at my work. And she was like, who are you? And then she turned around and probably spoke to like, the president of the world. And then I, like, I went again. And I was like, do you want to see my work? She was like, maybe. And then I followed her to the after party, like the psycho that I am. And then I showed it. I, I, after probably a drink, she said yes. And then, <laughs> and then she sat down with me. She looked at the sketchbook. She looked at my work. Uh, and she said, intern for me. So then I interned for her when I was uh, 13, turning. When I started, I was 14, actually, interning for her. And then that from there on, a dress that I made for her um, so sold out worldwide on, on net -Apport called the Andrea dress. And then I kind of, from there, got some validity, so to speak, within the region, and I started my own project. But even before that, I would work with ITP um, and help in shoots and things like that. So ITP is where I started my fashion career kind of thing, which is funny, right? You've got all the warm fuzzies now. Yeah. You know. um, I, that's, it's, it's such an inspirational story, and I think that it says a lot about tenacity as well as talent, actually. Because yeah. you literally were like, Alice, pay me attention. Yeah. She turned away, and you were like, no, no. Yeah. Pay me attention, <laughs> look at my stuff, uh -huh, you and look what happened. You need to. I mean, the thing is, um, in, in the world, I don't think people exactly want to give you an open door unless they love you, they're part of your family, or they come through a friend. People aren't going to open the door for you. It's not going to happen. You need to, like, kick, kick it. And everyone says, you've got to kick the door down. Um, but I think when you're starting off in a specific industry, um, you are still not known. You don't have a reputation. So you can actually be quite un un like, uh, shameless. And you need to do what you can to get there, because no one's going to give it to you. And if it's hard, then you just have to go a bit harder, in my opinion. Because no one's going to give it to you, so you have no other choice. And you have to be tenacious. Well, it's working for you. I think so. It is certainly. It's yeah. certainly. <laughs> um, so you ended up working for Alice in London, and then you were working at Prabal Garong in New York, yes. and then Bottega Veneta in Milan. Yes. Um, and I wanted to ask what the biggest lesson was that you took from each of them. I cannot have a boss. I'm <laughs> bossless. I can't have a boss. I can't be an employee. Mm -mm. Can't be one. You say that, but <laughs> <laughs> my next question was, I mean, you're, like I said, you're doing a phenomenal job um, you know, of your namesake label, and you're, and you're you. going from strength to strength. But if a Maison was to come knocking, whose call would you answer? Whose call would I answer? Yeah. Which check would I answer? No. <laughs> I'm just joking. I don't believe you. <laughs> I, no, it's true. It's true. No. Actually, you know what? I have this fantasy um, of an old 
uh, couture house that has maybe died a bit, that, that is completely like... Oh, I love a sleeping giant. One of the sleeping giants, and one of those up. would be interesting. Of course, you know, it really depends, because I wouldn't go into another label as a designer working for someone. I think I would go in as a creative director at this point. I'd work to get to that point. And so I'd be my own creative boss. You know, and there you have to, within, within the discourse of having a label, you have to always um, direct yourself back to the business entity that is what also makes decisions. So it's uh, collaboration. Um, but when we talk about fashion houses, honestly, I would love to have Chanel. You know why? <laughs> you, yeah, you know why? Because uh, growing up, um, my mother also was obsessed with Chanel. She loved the, I the idea of what it stood for, and she really valued. Um, it and we, we all know this. She she loved the brand, and so I grew up with the brand. So I can uh, I don't know. It's just personal to me. That's why. But if if uh, you know, we, I love Charles James, and he's an Anglo-American couturier. And if they released and they relaunched a brand like that, I think they should give it to me. Yeah, I mean, it makes no sense not to give it to me. I mean, you've already proved that you don't take no for an answer. So no. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, are you inspired by other designers, or do you? prefer to kind of, I don't know, like, uh, you know, completely do your own thing? Are you inspired from, comp I know fine art is a, is a, a, a big part of, of what you do, yeah. but do you look at other designers too? I look up to some designers for sure. I look up to the designers that are able to create a world that is almost painterly, which is why I like Perfado Piccioli from Valentino. I think that his couture is really beautiful. I like Daniel Rosebury from Scaparelli. I think it's, it's wonderful. These are people that I can relate to in that I'm not on their level in any shape, way, or form, but I can aspire to have their, level, their, their, their sensibility, which is what I'm looking for. Um, and I, I really think that they're doing an amazing job within art and fashion. Um, I don't look to, towards that many designers because I would get confused if I did. I need to stay in my own zone. How you get noticed is by being singular. Yeah, I, that's, well, that was kind of what I was, um, what I was getting at, really. OK. Um, I wanted to go back to the three cities quickly. Yeah. Because London, Milan, New York, and now you've come back to Dubai. Yes. Has being in those three major fashion cities brought a new perspective onto Dubai for you? Dubai is very much um, a place where you can understand a specific market. It's uh, consumer culture, and it's... Um, it's incredible for um, the understanding of commercial luxury. It understands it, 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 it acquires it. Um, so what I learned from Dubai is the value of what product you release wherever you are in the world and how it's going to be received and how it's going to be uh, bought and seen. So let's say if I, if I am in Europe, I can easily become incredibly creative and become really um, outside commercial creative, and I think in Dubai you can understand exactly what is trending because you see what, what, what the women or men are wearing and what's interesting. So you can actually see in Dubai more than you can in Europe uh, a categorization of what is commercially hot. Uh, and you can't see that in Europe because Europe is so individualistic that everyone has their own identity to a degree. And here also you have your own identity, but it's much more of a consumer culture, so it's a great study. What does that mean for creativity, especially when it comes to your creativity? It means that I isolate myself a lot. I don't really leave the house very often. Well, we're very happy you're here. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. I come out for you. <laughs> yeah. um, OK. Uh, I also wanted to touch on your experience as a, a third culture kid. Yes. Is that how you refer to yourself? Is that, uh, I mean Is that how we refer to ourselves? Yes. Yeah? Quite, because you know we're so multicultural. We have influences sure. from all over the world, um, and our parents are from different places. We we traveled when we were younger, and we grew into international schools. So many cultures lived everywhere. I love it. Um, and obviously, you grew up here, and I wanted to ask you about the um, about what it was like growing up as a very creative kid, specifically here in the 90s. How it was like growing up in Dubai in the 90s? Really, you know, Dubai in the 90s was really, really fun. I mean, it's fun now, but back then it was a bit more raw. So the buildings were smaller. Marina and all that area before didn't really exist. I mean, like, you know, downtown didn't exist. So it was more like Dera and Satwa. That was Dubai in the 90s. 
And when I go to Darren Satwa, I have loads of energy because it's a genuine market culture. A lot of the city is more new and built, but there it's a bit more the cultural hub of what every single person, the majority of nationalities here live in. So you really feel a sense of life. And that's what Dubai in the 90s and early 2000s was. Do you feel a responsibility to kind of pay it forward, creatively speaking, to the new gen of creatives that are coming out of Dubai? So the next you, for example. Hmm. As long as I'm able to inspire younger creatives to go for the industry that they want to go for in fashion, I've done my job. My, my objective is, is first and foremost to break my own creative boundaries. And in the process, organically, I hope other people can also be inspired. Um, but what I would say for, for the creatives, creatives within this region is that they should um, perhaps value um, the experience of the ones before them in this region that opened up doors for them. And to be honest, when I started working in, in Dubai at, at, four, at 13, actually, no one was doing it. And, and now the culture is opening a bit. But I could never know how I, how, how I could influence them. But I would love that idea. I want to talk about the pieces now. Yeah. Um, obviously, most of them look like feats of engineering. Yes. <laughs> um, and you know, as you've just explained, there's, there's, uh, there's blood sweat literally blood, sweat, and tears that go, uh, go into yes. them. Um, what does the process look like? So of, of doing the pieces? First of all, yes. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's about, first of all, you have to find the right team. Um, and so in the beginning, I go, like, you know, I've, I've worked with many different people now, um, and I found one that's really incredible. So when I start, let's start with the incredible person that I, that I work with who is wonderful and can learn very quickly. And they're based here? Uh, yes. So I don't draw. I never draw my sketches. I, I draw my fine art, but um, I, I never draw my looks, my fashion looks. I go in front of the mannequin, um, and then I will, will, uh, will kind of like come up with a theory of, of what I'm inspired by um, like uh, visually, and then I'll sculpt something flat, and I'll apply it to the mannequin, and then create a sculpture on the body. And then I do this with cardboard, and then cardboard and tape, or foam. And then I kind of bring it on to another kind of fabric or more cardboard. And I keep on going and breaking down the layers and joining everything through cardboard tape and everything and sculpt the shape that I like. Like there's this black leather shoulder which I made. And that was all in cardboard before. Um, I know it well. well. I've stared at images <laughs> of it for a long time, <laughs> wondering how you've done it. It was, uh, it was, well, it was inspired by a mathematical sequence, the Fibonacci sequence, and the, the logarithmic spiral. So it's, it's basically a sequence inherent in nature, and it's very profound. So I thought, how could I approach it in, to be honest, a more of an aesthetic way, a more of a, not a shallow way, but how can I bring it into an aesthetical world? Because fashion is very visual. And I applied it to the cutting process, and then I created the shapes on the body and sculpted around the mannequin, then around the person. But my work is like doing something like five, six to ten times and trialing it and changing the fabrics till it's a final fabric. What's the piece that you've created that you're most proud of? Um, I would have to say that the black leather piece and the blue, I have a blue coat, a blue velvet coat with crystals on it and a black leather piece because they're the most complex to make sleeves to make complex sleeves that actually stand on the shoulder in the way that you want is probably the most mind like mind can like a, like a exhausting thing but it's also interesting because where you move here is one of the most complex parts of the body so you have to construct something which works around this movement because the pants are always quite classical you can't create all these things down here but up here you need to actually get a movement so working around the sleeve is something which actually couturiers have always been obsessed with since the past hundred years. You'll find that most couturiers of the past were obsessed with sleeves. Did you have a specific module on sleeves at St. Martin's? A, a, a kind model. of a, a specific module, like literally like just a lesson on sleeves. No, no, no. Basically, Maybe no. They lesson. should introduce one. Yeah, no, I should leave that for you. Yeah. Um, the St. Martin's didn't really do any technical classes. Wait, they did one workshop in first year, one workshop, how to do pockets and a lapel. But they leave you. They, you, don't, you, don't have, you, you see your tutor two times a week, and you see them for maybe five to ten minutes. 
They don't teach you anything, actually. You have to teach yourself. And all your technical skill came from uh, your schooling in Paris, then? Well, in Paris, I was taught, um, in Paris, I was taught the basics of, of like, uh, proportional mathematics and how to apply that to the body. But when it comes to the actual shapes and sculptures, that's just my, my sculpting hand. No one taught me that. So you'll find that if I have to do a suit, for example, or something very classical, I find it more challenging than creating these things. Because, yeah, and, and th that's the truth. It's, like, it's always sculpture. That's why I say it's like artware. It's, like it's, it's, it's a mixture between fashion and art because it's a sculpture, fundamentally. Um, what are your thoughts on kind of talent as, as born versus made? Talent is born versus... Born versus made. There was actually an interesting quote about talent with the uh, Fran Leibowitz documentary on, uh, on, uh, on Netflix. Um, what was it called? Call it a city or something? Yeah, something with... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And she was like, uh, talent is uh, scattered. Um, and it's like, I, 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 she said it's like scattered around, but like you can't understand what it is or anything. I don't know. I mean, I can't even call myself like talented. It would be presumptuous. But what I, what I, yeah, but it's, it's a lot Come of... Come on now. <laughs> Um, I've been very blessed to be obsessed with drawing from a very young age, really obsessed. So I think my talent is born from my obsession. Because the talent for sure exists, but also it's a form of obsession because you constantly refine something, and if you keep it refining something, it works. But you can also see talent as intuition. So the intuitive nature to grasp onto something which you know will work for you and develop that. The intuition to actually look at something, identify it, and know that that belongs to you and you should nurture that. So talent is intuition, nurturing, and obsession. That's what talent is, in my opinion. I just invented that, but I think I'm accurate. I actually think that's a really good quote. I, I think that that's going that? to end up on your Wikipedia page, for sure. Um, you've already achieved so much. You're so young. What is next? What is next? What is next? I don't know what's next. <laughs> a lot of things are coming. What's next? Um, I want to, I really want to try and, <clears throat> I want to try and continue to find a way to develop the brand, collaborate with really interesting um, entities and forces inside of fashion and outside of fashion, and do collaborations to introduce new, um, new ways to approach to approach how a fashion brand can be born, because I don't think that, especially after COVID, for example, so many brands died during the pandemic. Um, so you know how unstable it is to be an emerging designer. It's very unstable. There's many doors that put in front of you. It's not that easy at all. However, um, when you collaborate with other entities, it's a bit more commercially feasible, because perhaps the collaborator that you work with has already the systems in place to create the product that you want to create. And you can share the profits. So I think this kind of way forward would definitely be a really interesting way to go forward with the brand. Um, I'll try my best to, uh, to continue with the arts. But also, I think that's pretty much what it is. Find a sustainable way to grow an emerging brand um, and not kill yourself with, with, uh, with like a, a, a production that's not bought. So we always discuss, Chantal's my sustainability director. So, yes, and so she looks at all the sustainable initiatives, like sustainable forces within the industry to apply. Um, and I think that, in my opinion, one of them is, is of course, you can't overproduce. You have to find a way to work on, on demand, not produce beforehand, and then, you know, maybe it doesn't, it, doesn't get, it doesn't get sold. But then there's another theory to this, which is you have, um, you have like net apporté for example. And if they buy, like, from you a hundred skirts or something like this, and if they pay for them, then I guess that's also a client and you're making it for them. So there's like different ways that you can actually under like try to understand what it is to not overproduce. The, uh, like because maybe they will buy that and so they are a client in themselves. However, if they don't sell, then it gets discounted onto the platform and your brand suffers. That's the problem. However, they are still a client. And so they're still buying the amounts that you need to survive as a brand. So you're fine financially, but then your brand might suffer because it might go to a really low price in the market and people will think that you're not good enough. I mean, there's a lot to think about, isn't the there? The art of seduction as a brand is very important. Oh, I love that. I think that's probably quite a good final quote as well. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Andrea. It's thank an absolute you. pleasure, honestly. Um, I'd love to throw some like, time out to the audience if anyone's got any questions for Andrea. Anybody?
Come on, I'm sure someone's got <laughs> a question for this extremely talented young man. Yes. Hi, Andrea. Thank you Hi. so much um, for the, all that. It was very insightful. Really enjoyed all of that. Um, Happy. Obviously, now, for yourself as a brand, and you're very creative, I'm just wondering, in terms of handling the business side of things, how do you balance that? You mentioned you have a great team. How do you find that team? There's, I'm sure there's more than one person on it. So how does that all work at, um, from a business standpoint, too? From a business standpoint, I, from a business standpoint, I think there's always a lot of drama um, because, like, Couture is inherently unbusiness friendly. Um, I just have to think, I just have to cut down the designs and think how can I make them as commercial as possible and wearable. And I'm still working on that actually, you know? I'm still very much a creative brand and like I, I'll, I do custom made pieces. Um, but it's always a struggle to approach the business side. So it's, uh, it's really now I'm working on, on products which are more business focused. Um, and, I'm in, and, and I can be able to answer that question for you in like a year properly. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Hi. Oh, um, I have a question for Andrea. And um, basically, I resonate, resonated with what you said about love-hate relationship with fashion. Um, I work in fashion myself. And I wanted to ask, how do you create the balance? And how do you find... Um, when you have a hate moment, let's say, like when, how do you create the love for it? How do you push yourself to balance, go back to the love? Do you have like techniques or something creatively that, that you do to keep yourself in a, in a good place with fashion and not have to, you know, I, think, I don't know if you get, yeah. I agree. I think um, someone who's always like to be totally transparent with you had some form of like mental instability honestly. So I think mental health for me is something which I'm starting to really kind of look into. So I, in many ways, can fall into spirals that are really negative. And then I get out of them eventually when I, um, I'm inspired. So what I do when I'm feeling really down and, like, uh, and, and dry of any form of inspiration, which is when you get like that, when you're not inspired is yeah. when you are, yeah. when you're hating it. Because when you're right. inspired, you're always moisturized, yeah, <laughs> creatively, <yeah. laughs> lubricated. Um, and I think you need to look at a history book. You need to research. You have to look at your favorite artist, for example. You need to look at um, um, your, favorite, your favorite anything. Even like you can look at a cartoon that, that you saw as you. a child. Yeah, yeah, you need to actually connect back to when you were a child because that will always make you feel a bit better. So Sailor Moon, going back to the anime, when I look at Sailor Moon, I'm like, oh my God, that was how pure, and that those were my intentions. And that makes you want to live life again and be a bit better at what you do. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think it's about referencing back to your past, referencing back to what, because your past is what inspires you. Because as it, you, you see something, it stays in your memory, and then it, it, it's what influences you as a person. So whatever you're inspired by now, anything that's even, even been invented today, yeah. is li um, and if you like it, even if it was invented today, it's linked to what you grew up being nurtured by. So if you're able to find inspiration in specific things which are what inspired you as a child, I think that can get you out of hating what you're doing because right. you did it for a reason. You don't end up in fashion because you hate it in the beginning. You end up because you're inspired by it because you're inspired by something else which inspired you to fashion. Yeah. Yeah. My that's opinion. a good one. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I think that's Welcome. a really, really good piece of advice. I think it also says quite a lot about how um, nostalgia can just generally bring quite a lot of joy. Yeah, a lot. I mean, nostalgia for me makes me more miserable than joyful. However, because I, even when I was eight, for example, this one time I woke up crying because I was not seven anymore. No, I was nine. And I woke up crying because I was having dreams of when I was eight. <laughs> yes, in school. And I was like, it's never going to come back because the idea of like, losing time is very, it's very uh, existential. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Please. Hi, Andrew. We met when you were 16. Yes, we and did. And I'm lucky you won the first lady who wear your dress. Yes. Um, I believe in you. I know you have a talent and very smart, very down to earth. Thank you. So when you were 16, you remember you came to my house with your dad? Yes, I remember. So tell us today when you become superstar, what kind of woman should be wearing your dread, or what kind of women who 
represent your dresses. Any woman that wants to feel larger than life, any woman that wants to feel larger than life should wear my fashion. Because if you want to wear it, it's larger than it's like the life. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's dramatic. It's kind of aggressive. It's you know it's impact. Like it, what I'm trying to say is that it is something which, when you look at it, you might look at it twice because that's the intention that I do it do behind it. I want it to stand as something strong. And so I think any woman that wants to feel larger than life is welcome to wear my clothes. I think you look like a good woman to wear. And <laughs> <that's> it. <laughs> it's like, like <laughs> lucky uh, me. I think there was one more question. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, I really love fashion and I'd love to get into it someday. What do you advise me to do? Do you have a specific, um, a specific category within fashion? Honestly, no. I, I have no clue. I am still a student. I'm studying in a totally different uh, part of fashion. So I really want to get into it someday, not now, after I graduate. So what could you advise me to do first? Bef before you graduate, start assisting um, photographers and stylists on shoots. So reach out to uh, editors, stylists, and um, you're lucky, but you're based in Dubai? Yeah. 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 So you're lucky that Dubai has the center hub of visual media linked to fashion. Um, so if you reach out and you try to find a way to assist in shoots for stylists, and et cetera, not just for magazines, but even for stylists, celebrity stylists, and things like that, then you can actually start having an insight and a network within people. And what's going to differentiate you, and I speak this out of experience from myself and my sister, for example, is that if you're good at your job and you're good at assisting and developing, then eventually you're going to get booked for more jobs and you're going to get a, create a career, a freelance career. And if, yeah, but you need to start by assisting and by um, hustling, basically, trying to put your foot in the door. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Good advice. Break into events. <laughs> Anyone else? I think there's a lady over here in a fabulous dress. Hi, Andrea. Hello. Uh, my question is, is do you see, how do you see the trend of fashion going? Is it going in a monotonous way, so it's like a cycle, or it's going out of a, a rhythm? There is this theory that fashion um, reintroduces itself every, every 40 years. So in the 40s, for example, you have a, was it Joan Crawford that had very strong silhouettes because the first hard chic was introduced by a Hollywood stylist? Mm -hmm. And then it was referenced, um, it was referenced in, um, in, the Ford, in the 80s, by the 40s, and the 80s hard chic came back because of the 40s, for example. Then uh, you have now 40 years ago is, yeah, and now we're back in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. 80s is kind of coming back now. So there's always a cycle of 40 years, in my opinion, that works. And I think that's always going to happen because I think people want to, I think humans are organic forces which think in a similar manner. Yes, we, we break down sensory levels as we, as we go into technology. Um, but I think fundamentally speaking and, and humanistically, we are prone to um, going into cycles, emotional cycles. Hmm? It's nostalgia again. It's nostalgia for yeah. sure. It's nostalgia and it's, it's, uh, it's uh, I think, a psychological cycle that humanity is in. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe like uh, a cycle where also you, yeah, even like the same as a life cycle. You know, you have your family, then they have their, like, you know, everything is a cycle, organic cycle, in my opinion. I don't think you're doing that though. And I think that that's what's quite interesting about your pieces because I've thought about this quite a lot, obviously, yeah. working in fashion for a while. But you're right, fashion is cyclical. Um, and sometimes you do get to the point where you feel like, have we seen everything? Yeah. Can anyone really be truly creative now? Yeah. And I say this like from the bottom of my heart, I feel like you genuinely are being very, very, uh, very fresh and, and doing things that people have not seen before. Thank you, thank you. And I think that's because um, it's honest, in my opinion. It's honest. And anyone that's honest will approach, if anyone is really honest and has enough um, influences in their life that may come from different sources, then those inspirations come together with an honest intention, create something which is unique in a way. Um, and I think that's what the modern designer is, because the world is becoming more globalized, people are traveling more, cultures are meshing, people are exposed to more cul different cultures, so the human of the future will be much more global than the human of, of the past. And therefore, if someone, and if an artist and a fashion artist, for example, approaches design in an honest manner, 
then they were reflecting who they are in their work, and that's going to be unique. It's an exciting time to be a Keturia, and an exciting time to be in Dubai, actually, it I is, think. It is, it is, <laughs> you know, and it's interesting because I, like, I, I started doing my, I did my Couture debut in July in Paris for C Couture Week, and now I'm here, so it's, it's like I have a conversation here, but I also have a conversation in Paris, in the center point. So I think that, for me, it makes me really happy. I think that's it, right? No one else has got a question? All right. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Andrea. I think that deserves a massive round of applause, honestly. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for listening and coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you.